Hello again, and welcome back to the Slow Flowers Show with Deborah Prinzing. This is episode 567. Well, if you're a longtime Slow Flowers member or follower, you know the origins of our organization are closely connected with those of the Seattle Wholesale Growers Market. I was present at the 2010 regional meeting of the Association of Specialty Cut Flower Growers, which was held at Charles Little and Company Farm in Eugene, Oregon. That's when a group of Oregon and Washington flower farmers began to discuss banding together to establish a new flower hub in the Pacific Northwest. They studied the model of the Oregon Flower Growers Association, a producer-owned cooperative founded in 1942, and they agreed to pursue the formation of something similar but updated to create a flower marketplace in Seattle. The following April in 2011, the Seattle Wholesale Growers Market Cooperative opened for business in Seattle's Georgetown neighborhood, not far from the conventional wholesale companies who had shown little interest in doing business with those local flower farms. You can read the story of these beginnings in my book, The 50 Mile Bouquet. Now it's been out for 10 years, since 2012. And ever since that first 2010 meeting in a flower field, I have been the self-appointed embedded journalist who has documented the story of Seattle Wholesale Growers Market. Now known as The Market, the destination is essential to the floral industry's fabric in the Pacific Northwest. The market has been studied as other regional groups of flower farmers all across the U.S. and Canada have emulated its model to establish a market for local flowers in their communities. I've had the privilege of interviewing most of the farmers who are part of the market, visiting their farms and spending time learning from them, not to mention enjoying the amazing beauty and superior quality of their floral crops for my own floral arrangements. In 2020, the market moved to the next level of management with hire, the hiring of Brad Seabee as their general manager. Brad's background as the president and CEO of one of the Seattle area's largest independent garden centers and also his background in general management in the commercial construction industry helped the market weather the challenges of COVID and help them come out on the other side stronger and more successful. I asked Brad to give us an update about what's been happening with the growth of the Seattle Wholesale Growers Market, and we recently sat down for a conversation in the plant room at the market. Let's jump right in and meet Brad Seabee. I'll share our sponsor thank yous at the end of the interview. Welcome back to the Slow Flowers Show with Deborah Prinzing, and I am coming to you from the Seattle Wholesale Growers Market, and it is my pleasure to introduce my guest today, Brad Seavey. Hi, Brad. Hi, Deborah. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm so glad I got you pinned down on your schedule that we could <laughs> we could finally sit down and talk about all that's happening at the growers market. And um, anyway, I just thank you so much for for sitting down with me. And uh, it's the middle of summer, so I can't believe you've even had time to talk. Oh, absolutely. Looking forward to it. <laughs> well, uh, Brad, I just have to acknowledge that the Seattle Wholesale Growers Market is now in its 11th year. Correct. You started in 2011. If you're watching this, you have to know about the Growers Market and you have to know what a model this special place is as a wholesale hub for local flowers that now is being emulated in many forms all across the country. So um, no wonder that everybody here is pretty pretty exhausted, but but committed still to bringing local flowers to the to the floral marketplace. Yeah, absolutely. Now the the local flower scene for us is just continues to grow here at the market, and uh, we're continuing to add new growers, new members to it, and uh, looking for new consignment growers as well, just to meet the demand. The uh, the current market right now, especially with uh, the return of events and weddings, has really just been explosive this wow. year. How many um, member growers are there? Because uh, this is a legal cooperative, right? Yes, yes, it is. So we have uh, 15 member growers currently at this time. Uh, during COVID, we did lose a few um, because of various reasons for farms sure. shutting down and people moving or retiring and so forth. So right now we have 15 members. Um, we have two uh, new provisional members uh, that are going through their trial period for becoming full membership uh, at the end of the year. And then we have a, a string of new uh, consignment growers as well that we keep adding to so we can meet the demands right now at the yeah. market. To use a baseball analogy, you've got your farm, te farm team and you're bringing them up to the majors, right? That's right, exactly. That's all I know about baseball. 
Um, and then uh, it's mostly people in Oregon and Washington, right? That's correct. Currently, um, it's mainly Washington, anywhere from up near Blaine, Canadian border, all the way down to South Central Oregon, down to Eugene area. So we have a really diverse range of farms, so we have all these different microclimates. And what's nice about it is it gives us a great extended season for product harvest because you'll have crops that are starting to become available in Southern Oregon, Central Oregon, um, months before up in Blaine. So wow. we can have this nice long extended season of product um, where normally if you're just buying from just one local source, it might only be for two or three weeks on some crops or for short you know, spring crops, for example. Um, or summer crops, so it just allows us to have a real diversity of product as well. Well, I hadn't thought about that. It's like your own version of succession planting, where exactly. you, you have yep. almost eight weeks of, of certain crops, whereas mm -hmm. if it was just within the 50 mile radius of Seattle, it would maybe be three or four weeks. Right, exactly. So for like on early spring crops like anemones and ranunculus, um, they'll still be producing those through up into mid-June wow. up north where they've been long gone down south because the heat hits and they're, wow. they're already done harvesting wow. for it. Well, you and I have known each other a little bit for a while through the horticulture <laughs> world. Uh, Quite a while. Yeah. <laughs> Back when I was a garden writer, you were the, the general manager of one of the biggest independent garden centers in Seattle. Correct. Um, I loved to go to Swanson's mainly because I could bring my kids there and let them run around and there was a nice cafe and yep. you always had reindeer at Christmas or some kind of yeah, all kind. We Some had kind of all North the, Pole animals. <laughs> yeah, reindeer and camel, and we had all kinds of events going on. Yeah, for the families. Yeah. Yeah, and then uh, when the market had an opening and were, they were really recruiting for like like professional level leadership, mm -hmm. lo and behold, you showed up and and they grabbed you and um, I'm, I'm I think everyone's so grateful that that you made the transition from horticulture to floriculture. And um, maybe you could talk a little bit about, and by the way, that was January of 2020, right? That's correct. Okay. Yep. Right before the, the big event. <laughs> the big C. <seat. laughs> what, what appealed to you about running a, a market like this? Do you have a background in cut flower growing? Um, well, I'm an avid gardener myself, mm. and um, my wife is a florist. And we had, years ago, had visions of having our own cut flower farm. Oh, I and didn't so, know that about you. Yes, wow. Yes. Um, in fact, when we moved over, because I'm originally from southern Idaho, when we looked at moving over to this area here, we looked at property in Oregon, basically, or doing flower farming. And then I also had been in the green industry with nurseries uh, for quite a while previously. So um, we decided to stay with the nursery side of things and so forth. So I've always, um, we've always had a passion for growing a lot of our own cuts at home yeah. and really experimenting with a lot of the landscape material, which is what's perfect been here for transition because many of our farmers are looking for unique products and many of them have also landed on some landscape stuff, but right now we're kind of helping coach and guide our growers to growing new additional crops, mm -hmm. which are not a traditional floriculture crop that work well and have great vase life yeah. and have that unique quality and textural appearance. On That's it. smart. So that diversification is really helpful. Yeah. And it sets us apart because it's not something you're going to find in any other of the wholesale flowers. Yeah. And many of our designers love to have those unique products that they can find here at the market. So give me an example or two of what, what you kind of nudged people along to start growing that surprised the, them when, when well, the florists responded. Well, there's just a, a lot of foliage crops mm -hmm. that uh, a lot of our members were starting to get into and but doing more of, but there's just so many of the different types of viburnums uh, for either for yeah. the, that are basically can be sold on a year-round basis because right. you've got year-round evergreen foliage for most all of them and then you've got different bloom times with either the, the buds because sometimes the buds on viburnum in late winter look beautiful mm -hmm. then there's a flower period and then of course then you have the buried period so there's a diversity of crops whether it's you know yeah. spring bouquet or any of the other you know blue buried forms yeah. there's just so many varieties that just work so well and there's a lot of perennial crops too that just lead themselves really well to uh, production here and a lot of even other flowering shrubs, whether it's, uh, you know, osmanthus or, mm -hmm. or choisia or different things that still right. there's not a lot of production on. There's a lot of potential and a lot of our farms have crops in the works, but it's going to be, you know, it can take three to five years, up to even eight years to develop a woody crop for production harvesting. It's yeah. a challenge. So 
we've got a lot of stuff in the pipeline uh, coming along at the farms and we're looking to get even more stuff planted. I learned the term from Charles Little years ago of permaculture, and mm -hmm. it, it, I, I'm totally paraphrasing it, but it, he kind of explained it to me like, look, you basically plant it and then it's the gift that keeps on giving. And, and I think that's what you're <laughs> alluding to with these long term, you know, kind of the long game for right. Woody's. Long game and all of our farms grow sustainably as well, so it's just it's a perfect way of doing and managing a lot of their landscapes. Most of our farms we're working on becoming, you know, certified salmon safe, so they're having product that not only encourages a lot of native habitat and wildlife and so forth like that, but also you know, it helps bring in beneficial insects yeah. and other, other animals and stuff too. So it's a perfect fit for a lot of these farms That's to be, so be growing all these different variety of crops and so forth like that, have a real good diversity on their farms. It gives them um, a lot of, a lot more opportunities for, for growth basically yeah. and, and variability too, because invariably mother nature is not always kind <laughs> and you're going to have crop failures or yeah. bugs or yeah. hard frost or freeze and you know it just, just happens. So. But that's kind of the benefit of having a co-op in that um, you're not w utterly dependent on one farm for a particular uh, category and exactly. so you're, you're coaching the f or working with farmers right. to spread the risk basically. Exactly and we do a lot of crop coordination as mm -hmm. well because we try to coordinate crop harvesting from again the, the southern growers to the midsection to the northern growers it's kind of sequence when they're doing their timing and staggering of crops and so everybody's somewhat aware of it and then also opportunity as well because some people may have really good luck in certain areas growing certain crops but not in others because just the, their locations yeah. as well yeah. you know up north the challenge up there is you get all that Fraser River cold and the winds out of Canada and a lot of stuff gets burned and fried up there whereas down in central or Oregon or southern Washington, you don't have as much of that, you know, that Fraser yeah. River Valley influence yeah. that you do weather-wise. Yeah. Wow. Uh, okay, well before we started recording we were kind of reminiscing about the fact that you did start here at the beginning of 2020. I was feeling particularly sympathetic to, wow, this guy is like jumping in feet first <laughs> in in Valentine's Day, like, oh, what could be worse than surviving Valentine's Day? Yeah. And weeks later, obviously, we were hit with COVID, and um, it, it was a, it was an, an opportunity, I guess, for your creative problem solving because you had to just pivot right away, uh, along with the farmers. And uh, do you feel like you're kind of coming out of that? Like, there were some things you observed about oh, what what saved you in 2020, what saved you in 2021. Can you yes. talk about that? Oh, absolutely. Um, so yes, with the cancellation of all major events and, and probably the biggest challenge we had was the fact that the state of Washington did not recognize floriculture as an essential business and so we worked with the Washington State Department of Agriculture and a variety of different other entities to try to get that approved and finally we were able to so for a couple months there we were completely shut down but luckily it was kind of early it, it was, was almost early before it, the, was, the it was it was a march march and april period mm -hmm. and of course some of the big challenges the farmers had was the fact that they, they all this happened right before they were hi did a lot of their hiring and they couldn't hire people uh, everybody was being sequestered and a lot of their crops hadn't even come in or were even ready to be planted or could be planted so a lot of them were able to adjust but the challenge was a lot of these farms which normally operate with multiple staff were down to just the, the farmers themselves the owners, yeah. the owners typically uh, running the farm so that put a real strain on their logistics and capability for harvesting and so a lot of them just didn't even plant crops or if they did have crops they were very selective about what they chose to plant and use that we could do so our focus really was since that grocery and food stores were essential businesses and operating and all the florists were forced to shut down there were no events so our best channel would be to focus on you know the grocery uh, mass merchant mass merchant category so we really focused on that because the demand for flowers was huge out there because people had a strong need and if anything more there's even a greater need yeah. during COVID for flowers because people were trapped at home and they wanted to celebrate themselves or others the only way you could do that best ways with flowers. So. It, but it's not like you hadn't been doing business in mass merchant merchandise or mass market before, right? Correct. That's correct. Okay. But the demand just grew exponentially that year. So it sort of kept everybody afloat. It did. It helped wow. fill the gap uh, without weddings uh, and large events happening. It, it was a little bit of a challenge because the grocery market is a different 
palette mm -hmm. in a different mm -hmm. uh, selection of flowers. It's, um, you mean they don't like blush and, it's and not white? As, it's maybe not as refined <laughs> as some people might like, yeah. but you know, the interesting thing too is a lot of our local florists, once things started opening back up during COVID and they were able to do uh, contactless deliveries and a lot of them pivoted also to doing their own uh, subscription services, mm -hmm. which worked really well. Um, people were looking for more bright and different colors, so there are quite a few uh, event people that pivoted to becoming other designers and filling that gap and need as well. And people were more enthused about the colors and yeah. stuff, and so um, it really kind of changed, and then even several of them are still doing that today, and then a lot of them, they just, their whole wedding palette changed and started looking much different than the traditional wedding colors. I hadn't thought mixture. about that. Maybe you can point to that sort of need for color and vibrancy that changed yes. the palette of of the floral industry. It really has. Wow. I think I think COVID did affect that considerably. And it's still active today, but you see a lot more really more colorful wedding work being done. There's still the need there's still the request from yeah. a lot of brides for the traditional look. Yeah. But there's a lot more you have a little more wiggle room. A little more wiggle room and a lot more choice of diversity of product material that you're seeing the designers using nowadays and requesting for weddings. So if 2020 was kind of the year of the grocery store, what mm -hmm. was 2021? And then let's talk about this year. Sure. Well, 2021 was when activities were slowly starting return. It wasn't until like mid-summer when they actually were allowed full weddings, although there was a lot of events happening, mm -hmm. you know, under the radar, under the radar or, so or like speak. micro weddings, micro stuff, weddings, yeah. tons of micro weddings going on. And so the wedding demand really started surging because there was such a huge backlog and the floral demand was exceeding supply still. So we were scrambling to add ad additional consignment growers to our, our market as well. Um, our member farms were able to start hiring, but you know, labor is still limited, and it still is a challenge even today for a lot of farms, yeah. and even here at the market, because they say that labor supply is I so I saw short you handed. had two job openings posted already yes, are yes, up on the front door. Yes, we still door. do, and fortunately we've got a, a new driver starting on Tuesday. Uh, so yeah, the demand is really high and for, for labor in all industries, yeah. basically, right now, after so many people have decided to have a mass exodus yeah. to somewhere. <laughs> so when, when weddings kind of bounced back about a year ago, did, did grocery just sustain grocery so you just had more continuing. demand? continuing, yes. Okay. Grocery is still continuing its demand um, and still growing as well. Uh, the need for flowers is even greater and it gives the, the people a lot more enjoyment. And so you're seeing the grocery markets still sustain, sustaining themselves, but we'll have a lot more floral work mm -hmm. now with all the events returning. So end of last year was big, but this year, a lot of people were still being cautious and a lot of venues were already booked up last year. So this year, and of course, early this year, they were all booked up. So they're, you know, booking weddings clear into next year still. So so there's, um, you're seeing a situation where florists are like maybe doing more than one wedding a weekend. So they're, even their business is growing, which yep. ripples effect to demand here. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. And so you talked about seeking new farmers. Are people, are, do you feel like you have to do a lot of, um, uh, I don't know, cold calling or like networking or do, do people find their way here well, through a the lot word of, of mouth? A lot of people find their way here through word of mouth. Uh, we do also do networking and we also, you know, reach out to all of our members and because a lot of them know farmers in their region as well and have, you know, recommendations or people are talking to them and suggest that here's a way to work the market. And several of them, um, actually a lot of farmers have traditionally used public farmer markets to sell right. their product. And right. they're starting to realize the amount of time and commitment and energy that takes and it's not always that profitable because uh, they're selling stuff to the general public and typically- It might be retail, but there's a price you pay to do that. There's a price you, there's a price you yeah. pay and the farmer's market is not a premium type product like you're getting out of for, for commercial design work. So That's a good point. Um, a you're lot of selling them, a premium product here right. and farmers are getting paid for a premium product. Yes, exactly. But there's also a little bit of a transition because there are some farmers that fit the farmer's market model because they traditionally harvest things too late. So it's a lot of education too. Mm -hmm. So we developed um, several hundred um, guides basically for all the products we have so that we can be consistent st on our standards and specifications. Wow. So we share that with our members and also new you know, prospective members so that the specs for harvesting, stages of harvest, 
and pictures and pictorials and examples and so forth like that because what we need to have as a wholesale market is consistency. Mm -hmm. Product needs to be uniform so whether a florist is ordering you know ten bunches of a certain variety of dahlia or, or zinnia, zinnia or whatever, scabias, yeah. whatever it might be, it needs to be consistent so that when you get you know bunches from different farms they don't look that noticeably different where so sometimes the customer might not know that three farms have fulfilled that order exactly because Be it's because consistent because the, yeah. the, the the bunches the pack count the stem lengths the size of heads all those things are consistent and specified in our specification so that's crazy uh, several hundred seems like a lot but i know that the number of flowers in the inventory database here flowers and foliage and yes. other botanicals I, it must be in the thousands. It's, it's the, we have over 4,000 line item entries in our database really? for all the farms. Wow, and the 4,000 would, would reflect like every single different color or? Different colors, different varieties, and then also the fact that we um, have all the different member farms. And there's also some of them have different specifications because you might have the same product but you have mass merchant specifications. Those bunch counts are going to be a smaller bunch. Um, they're sold at a smaller price point because a grocery wants to sell them at a you know ten to twelve dollar retail mm -hmm. price point. So so they're getting so a three or five stem. They're bunch. getting three to five stem bunch exactly mm -hmm. is how they're doing that. So and when you use the word uniformity, the first thing that came to mind was that that sort of seems like a negative, but only because we know how quirky florists are and how much they want the bent stems yes. and the twisted, yep. uh, you know. And form, there's, and but there's you have allowances that in, for that as well. Okay, how do you so, do that? <laughs> so, for example, on some grading or, or sizing examples, we unlike even just foliages, we'll have st we'll have tips, we'll have standard length, we'll have tall, and then we'll have extra tall. And in some cases, we might even have extra extra tall. Like a tree. So, so they might range from 12 to 15 inch height. You know, and standards might be something like 18 to 24 inch, and then of course then you've got 24 to 36, and then 36 to 48, and then maybe it's 5 to 6 feet. Wow. So we have all those different sizes. So you might have one skew, and you might have, you know, five different ways of selling got that it. same product. And then some of them even might be a single stamp. Some of them might be bunches of 10, bunches of five, bunches of three. So depending on the size of the bunch and the size of the product, you'll have different stem count and different bucket count and so forth like that. So it's so that's, based that's on part of that, what I mean by consistency yeah. is that we can keep uniform grading and sizing, which helps us for uniform pricing on the floor, so we can have a price sheet that we have and, and customer expectations as well as what they're going to get for sizing. It gives them a lot of ranges for options yeah. too, because depending what they're producing, they might have a need for a longer branch or stem length uh, or shorter stem length. So depending on their yeah, and that just comes from the over a decade of experience of the farmers learning from the florists and vice versa to understand how the product that they're growing is being designed with, right? Correct. Yeah. Yep. And large events typically need larger product, whereas smaller bo events or smaller bouquets or other programs just need just the They're fine with the they're shorter. They're fine with the shorter stems. Yeah. But if you're doing some big, large outdoor wedding or big, huge indoor thing, you're looking for something for these big spaces. Big yeah. spaces. Yeah. And you need large stems and large pieces of foliage and also flowers, too, to fill those areas. I love it. I love it. Um, so talking about all of that inventory, uh, the, one of the reasons I wanted to do this interview was to catch people up on the growers market, feature you because we haven't had you on the podcast, but the mar you and the, and the board and several of the farmers have been working toward this new online database, I don't know how you describe it, catalog, um, and you just recently rolled it out sure, in it's, April. It's a, basically it's an e-commerce platform, okay. basically. So. What it is, is it allows us to offer our products and our inventory online for customers to order direct. They can go to our website, they can create a login based off their email address on their account they have, and of course it tracks all their order history and their volume so they can look at invoices or have print out copies. So it just it facilitates a lot of their business needs, but it also has a, a database in there of what's available for the current period. So the way the system's set up is that the order period opens uh, like each week and it's for delivery the following week so you're ordering in advance so okay. it's like a one week out type scheduling so you order an order now for pickup next week and so we have different days for cutoff periods when there's deadlines for ordering but it just allows the customer to go in 
look at the database, see what's new. We've always had our fresh sheet, and so basically the fresh sheet is kind of live and online now. We still produce our email fresh sheet, but right now you can also go to online, and you can look up on there, and a lot of the products have pictures attached. We're still adding to our inventory and pictures as crops are coming in right now, so we're furiously taking photos and getting those uploaded. <laughs> you said you took 50 today. <laughs> I did 50 today. I've got to get them uploaded still. but um, So it gives them a, a good representation of what's actually here in the market, where that lessens any confusion or misunderstanding of yeah. product that people are ordering, which is helpful. Yeah, I, I, we were talking earlier and, and I, I started to picture what you were describing, that there's so much um, documented in that order because of what's in the database mm -hmm. and the photo attached to that particular variety someone's ordered. Exactly. There shouldn't be any question about color. Whereas mm -hmm. back in the day, people yeah. would call you and say, do you have peach ranunculus? Yes. And, and there's, then they're there's like, no, no, I meant coral. <laughs> there's umpteen shades of peach or yeah. coral, depending on who's describing it, or salmon. Or, <laughs> right, you know. right. So it, it does help a bit. The only minor challenge is obviously with computers is your monitor and your mm. color settings. And so there is some variability sure. there, but by and large, it's, it's much better than what it used to be. So, Well, and from a labor-saving point of view, as your customer base exploded, you could not staff to manage, especially weddings and special event uh, pre-orders, right? I mean, yeah, that was, was it, insanity. Well, it's, it's still, well, we still manage a lot of that because a lot of events are placed, you know, orders are well in advance. So, oh, so you can't use that next week thing. Next week thing, yeah. but we still we still have a system for managing the, the three months from now, the four month or six month out orders because we recommend people, if, as soon as you get an event scheduled, please get your flowers booked right away because there is a limited market out there and there's shortages worldwide, yeah. not just local. And so the demand is huge everywhere for, for getting sourcing product. So I heard about that with certain crops this year that were like white lilac were completely pre-ordered before yes. they even were in bud. Yes, and, um, we're, and we're seeing a lot of that too. And a lot of our summer crops, even though we've, we still have a lot of stuff coming on, we have so many pre-orders for big weddings and events already that there's certain time frames that we're going to be sold out of, you know, peaches and cream dahlias because we can only produce a certain number of bunches in any given week from all the different farms. Even though you've got like six farms growing it Even probably. though you have six farms growing it, there's just a certain capacity that each farm has. I mean, they may even have a hundred foot row, but even still, at some point you're gonna reach, you can only harvest so many bunches yeah. per week per, per row footage and you just you reach those capacities. So the sooner people get orders in, the, the better for those things. A lot of that is just communication and training and yep. Yep. onboarding. But um, I guess the goal really it, to sustain the Seattle Wholesale Growers Market as a viable business that supports local flowers is to not have anything left in the field every week. I mean, in Ideally, a perfect world, yeah, right? Yep. Um, I know that doesn't isn't real or realistic. Like you said, Mother Nature has variables, but um, in general, are you in a point now where farmers are feeling confident to expand uh, what they're uh, like the land they're devoting to growing space yes. and, and kind of forecasting growth for next year? No, absolutely. A lot of farms are um, expanding operations and then we have other farms that actually are fine-tuning their operations because they've, they've got the, the knowledge from the cells we've been doing recently and, and tracking in this a new our new platform also gives them even a greater amount of detail for forecasting in the future now that we're using this so that they can better plan for what crops and what's selling when, and also looking to see what crops are more feasible than others and which ones are making you money and which ones aren't. Mm -hmm. And there's several farms that have actually decided not to grow certain crops because they really, a lot of them aren't pro that profitable unless you're really into it or focusing on yeah. it. So it's just one of those things, it's, it's giving the farmers a better tool yeah. so they can help manage their business. And that's what we are doing in partnership with the farms is helping them take the sales side off of it so they're not out there having to go shop to shop or set up different locations around town or do a yeah. bucket truck right. do rounds. They can be a member of the market or consign products to the market and then we are the sales team that, that promotes their products and on our online marketplace and our website we promote all the farms, we give the links so there's full transparency and with our system the farmers can log in to their products, see what's selling and what isn't selling, uh, they can post availability, they can control that availability at any given time during the week, um, which is nice, it gives them a lot of flexibility. So somebody might say, well, I've got 
you know, 50 bunches of this available, and then something happens weather-wise, and say, oh, I can go back in and say, oh, I'm only going to have 30, or the vice versa. They mm -hmm. might say, I've got 50, and actually I could probably harvest 70 bunches. So they can yeah. go in and adjust those quantities so we can not only see it on our end uh, for customers for ordering online, but we can also use it for our end for, you know, because we do a lot of admin order entry because we get people emailing and calling on the phone right. for products. The, so man, the manual ordering. The manu manual ordering. So we're ending those orders in the system. So it's a kind of a hybrid system we're using now. But as more and more customers get familiar with it, the advantage is they can go on there and see what's readily available and book it themselves. What's the platform? Can you tell us that? Well, sure. It's actually um, it's d designed for the food hubs. It's a local food marketplace as a platform we're using. And um, it, you know, it's originally set up to be selling produce and meats and wow. basically food food co wow. products. For but they food understand health. how cooperatives work. It sounds but like. But they or? work with cooperatives. Okay. So the the format and the platform was there. And what appealed to me about it is the fact that because they were designed for co-ops and farms, they had this individual capability of the growers logging in and having their access to theirs. But it integrated since it was like a food hub model. And so it was perfect for a flower hub model or, or yeah. Seattle Wholesale Growers Marketplace. Because the customer is coming on and kind of seeing an aggregated inventory yes, absolutely. and they don't need to know what's behind the curtain. They, but they also can, they have this capability. So um, Oh, I see, because they can know what farm everything is. Right, from. exactly. So you can click on it and you can choose which farm you want to order from or you can just, just order off what's there. So I mean, it gives them flexibility for what, yeah. how they can do it. And it also allows us to, if we need to sub orders and stuff, we can do that as well from wow. other growers. I know this has been like a multi-year project um, and you're still, as you said, adding photos and, and it's going to be an evolving thing because new crops will become, yes. uh, you know, yeah, show up and you'll have to in integrate those. Yeah, we've I've added probably six new items this week that we didn't have in our inventory wow. before. So the, the nice thing about the system is it has, we have a, a global database and then we link that global database to each farm based on the products that they grow. So we don't like have to reinvent the wheel every time, but we have the capability oh. to customize that right. for each farm. So right. if we wanted to, we can have a, a, gener a general picture for the product. But if we want to get very specific, if one farm has a little bit different variation or unique aspect, we can post a separate picture for just that farm only. And if we needed to, we can even you know, if they offer it in a special size or thing that nobody else has, we can do that as well. So it gives us a lot of diversity wow. and flexibility. Wow. I want to ask you what's next, but I think <laughs> I think you're probably like living in the moment. <laughs> well, uh, what's next is obviously the local demands exceeding our supply, but we're hoping at some point here we can continue to grow our membership and and get new farms as part of the market that we would like to expand our online platform and actually start doing some more regional shipping. Mm -hmm. um, that's something we thought I of. I know you've been asked about this forever, so yes, it you is. should be still, careful saying it it's now. Still, it's still on the, the list out there, but right now I say we just want to meet the local needs of our, our, our local florists that support us here. But at some point when we get production and capacity up, the demand is out there yeah. for this product. And it'd be, it'd be nice to be able to help you know, the sustainability of our local farms, which is the goal of our market, to help promote their product outside of the area of Seattle as well. So when you say regional, you mean like maybe to ne neighboring states or neighboring to eastern states. part of Washington, exactly. eastern Oregon? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So things that would be, um, uh, just my understanding of shipping, like ground shipping would be overnight. Yes, be like overnight, yeah. like FedEx or something keep, keep like that. Keep the price keep, reasonable. Yes. Wow. Yeah. That's great. Well, I So we're not looking at LTL <laughs> shipments or anything <laughs> yeah. like that or full truck stuff. So. Yeah, I mean, it that's another that's a whole different business model. Right. But we get calls all the time from people from florists back in the Midwest and the East wanting to know if we ship product and so we just don't have the the capability because of the the lack of supply to yeah. meet those needs, but I'm sure once we're ready we're going to have a, a, a good marketplace for Or maybe that. you say to that person in the Midwest, find a florist friend in Seattle, have that person come in and shop and pack up and ship for you. And yep, that's like, always an option. You don't yep. have to ha touch that box, <laughs> but you'll get there. Wow. Yep. Well, I wanted to talk just a little bit about the fun project that we, we did together during COVID, which was so crazy. but the USDA grant that the growers market mm -hmm. received. Well, it's, it's, it's basically for, you know, 
women most, owned? Most of, most of our member farms are women owned mm -hmm. and then a lot of them are also other minorities too. So it allows that capability. So the funding was there and we had a lot of activities planned to take advantage of the grant, of course, then COVID happened and put a, kind of squashed all those ideas. Well, we did. I got to work, though, on some fun virtual things with, with the growers market because um, uh, the growers market brought in Soul Flowers as sort of a subcontractor to help with some of the content. I just have to say, the it was a joy for me to go with the videographer, Elena Earhart, mm -hmm. and go to these farms during COVID we were out in the open air, we were so very, very dis socially distanced, yeah. and we got to film um, some beautiful videos oh, of, those, the, of videos the farmers are, are here. The videos are amazing. They're just so, such, so, so beautifully done and artistic. Yeah. It's just, just, I know I've seen the farmers almost bring tears to their eyes watching them. It's just very, very thoughtful pieces that Elena put together for And the us. goal, the goal is to use those for marketing, and uh, people can just be wooed by the, the tremendous like it, quality and beauty that's being produced by the members of this And of their this passion market. too. It oh. just comes through in their voice and yeah. it's just when you hear some of them speak about their farms and it's just really it's so emotional. Yeah, their yeah. expertise, they yeah. really, they, they're teachers. They want to share. Yeah. Absolutely. Like, can anybody um, create an account yes. here, even if they're from out of state, say they're coming for a destination wedding? Yes. How, how do they do that? You, would, it just um, our our link for it is on our main website, SeattleWholesaleGrowersMarket.com. If you go to our order page, it'll say like create an account. Three, three different ways to order from okay. us, and so you can one come to the market. Um, the other is our online marketplace, so that's the section to go to, and there's a link in there you can click to, and it takes you to the online marketplace. Okay. Uh, there's a place you can click login, create create a login, and you can create um, a, a public customer login, so we can sell our DIY buckets, which mm. we do sell a lot of DIY buckets. That's the only thing we currently sell to the public. We also are open public hours on um, Tuesdays and Fridays. From, I'm sorry, I forgot to ask you about yeah, that. Yeah, from. Uh, from 10 to 1. Okay. And that has really blown it up too. We really are super busy because before we were only open on Fridays and because of COVID when we were starting and to help move product we increased to a Tuesday start. So we do Tuesdays and Fridays both. But we do sell the DIY buckets online. Um, public customers can't pre-order anything but they can pre-order the buckets which okay. are nice. So, wow. So um, you're training them to create online accounts too? Yes. So they can do that and the order the DIY buckets online. but. Uh, Floral designers then sign up. There's a series of questions and drop downs on selecting the type of business and the structure of your business and so forth. And then we ask for business credentials as well. So, you know, copy of uh, business license and if it's tax exempt for the state of Washington, you know, Resell. the reseller permit. Mm -hmm. All those things wow. are required. And then we get them set up. And nice thing about it is that before we really didn't have the infrastructure to take payments online or to have the secure connections and this has very secure connections because it's hosted by third party so nice makes it much easier to do yeah. that so people can save their credit card and information and so we do a lot of them are set up for aggregate billing once a week so the purchase they make all the week we process payments at the end of the week on their card they have on file in the system which is nice and secure just and then more efficient that it's way. just a lot more yeah. efficient wow uh, this little place, this little engine that could, has grown into like <laughs> such such a force, and it's so inspiring to, get, well, it's, to it's, witness it. It's been wonderful watching it grow, and it's like it, we still have a lot more potential. And I say the the market floor uh, is just wonderful this time of year. It's just like it's amazing how much product we have coming in here uh, uh. throughout the week. Brad, last question: What is the favorite your favorite thing that you're growing in your own garden? Because I know you're a plantsman. And you probably have something that you're excited about. Oh, I'm a collector of all varieties of plants. So oh, I have drifts of one. Is that what they call yeah, that? Yeah, it's not drifts of one. I've got I, I have lots of lots of everything. So oh. I don't have any particular favorite. But um, but you're surrounded by it all here. But got it all here. But no, I I have big collections of all kinds of different perennials and shrubs and woodies and things. So my, my yard's not big enough either. So I'm, yeah. So I'm in the process of doing a lot more editing now and, and you know, fine tuning that as well. Maybe someday you'll retire from this job and actually be a flower farmer. I don't know. It's yeah. not an old man's job though, is it? <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but it's, it keeps you young. It, can keep, it does keep you young and there's, there's nothing more enjoyable than growing and harvesting and working yeah. with flowers. It's like, how, how can you have a bad day when you've got all this, surrounded by all the beauty of oh, flowers? I, I agree. 
Thank you so much. This has been great. And um, we will have links to all the references that Brad has shared and uh, when we post this as a podcast and um, have the replay video at slowflowerspodcast.com. So Brad, thank you so much. Well, it's been so, a pleasure, Deborah. It's been as wonderful. Always. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us today. You heard me mention the recent series of videos that Slow Flowers produced as part of the USDA marketing grant. Check out the show notes for next week's Slow Flowers podcast, episode 567 at slowflowerspodcast.com. And you can watch a compilation of many of those beautiful flower farm videos. I'll also attach the recent published case study about the Seattle Wholesale Growers Market and their history and their cooperative model, which was authored by cooperative expert Margaret Lund as part of that USDA grant we discussed. You'll learn so much more diving into that report. Before I go, I also would like to thank our sponsors who bring this show to you. Full disclosure, the Seattle Wholesale Growers Market is a longtime sponsor of the Slow Flower Society. And we're grateful for their partnership in bringing free podcast and vodcast episodes to you. This show is brought to you by slowflowers.com, the free online directory to more than 850 florists, shops, and studios who design with local, seasonal, and sustainable flowers and to the farms that grow those blooms. It's the conscious choice for buying and sending flowers. And thank you to our lead sponsor, Farm Grow Flowers. Farm Grow Flowers delivers iconic burlap wrap bouquets and lush, abundant arrangements to customers across the U.S., supporting U.S. flower farms by purchasing more than $10 million of U.S. grown fresh and seasonal flowers and foliage annually. Discover more at farmgrowflowers.com. Thank you to Longfield Gardens, which provides home gardeners with high quality flower bulbs, and perennials. Their online store offers plants for every region and every season, from tulips and daffodils to dahlias, caladiums, and amaryllis. Check out the full catalog at Longfield Gardens. That's longfield-gardens.com. Thank you to Johnny's Selected Seeds, an employee-owned company that provides our industry with the best flower, herb, and vegetable seeds, supplied to farms large and small, and even to backyard cutting gardens like mine. Find the full catalog of flower seeds and bulbs at johnnyseeds.com. And thank you to the Gardener's Workshop, which offers a full curriculum of online education for flower farmers and farmer florists. Online education is more important than ever, and you'll want to check out the course offerings at thegardenersworkshop.com. The Slow Flower Show is a member-supported endeavor, and I value our loyal members and supporters. If you're new to our weekly show or our long-running podcast, check out all of our resources at slowflowersociety.com and consider making a donation to sustain Slow Flower's ongoing advocacy, education, and outreach activities. You can find the donate button in the column to the right at slowflowerspodcast.com. I'm Deborah Prinzing, host and producer of The Slow Flower Show and The Slow Flowers Podcast. Next week, you're invited to join me in putting more slow flowers on the table, one stem, one vase at a time. The content and, and opinions expressed here are either mine alone or those of my guests alone, independent of any podcast sponsor or other person, company, or organization. Thanks so much for joining us today, and I'll see you next week. <laughs>